get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more. Today, we have Jordan Harbinger, who's co-founder of The Art of Charm that started back in 2006, and Jason DeFilippo, executive producer and co-host. And I read, I think you've been building websites since 1994. Jason, uh, they teach advanced social skills training for high performers. They're consistently in the top 10 of business iTunes, top 50 of all of iTunes, and get over 2 million downloads a month. Recent guests include Larry King, Dan Harris, Brian Koppelman, hundreds more. Go to theartofcharm.com. Check out many of their awesome episodes. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Thank you. And when you said play the Magnum PI theme song, play it. that was when I was supposed to do it. Hit it. Right now. <laughs> That's enough of that. Anyway, um, so, so glad I have a soundboard. So this is part of the Pro Podcaster series where we talk about the behind the scenes of how pro podcasters like both of you outsource and automate workflow. So we're going to get a little geeky with podcasting. And, you know, Jordan, pod, you've been in the podcast uh, landscape for two, since 2006. What did it look like then? What were you using for equipment? <laughs> what was what were some of the early episodes? Tell me about 2006. Yeah, so we were like, okay, we need to hook up microphones to our computer, and we didn't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think at that point, even the Max that my friend had, AJ, business partner now, yeah, I think they still had a microphone built into the keyboard, although I'm not totally really? sure. Okay. I could be wrong. I mean, it's been. I think a you were while. probably using SCSI back then. Maybe they had line in though, so we. I think we had like a line in, and it didn't work very well. And we we were like, oh, this sucks. So AJ called Guitar Center, and we were like, okay, we want to hook up mics to the computer. So we walk in, and we found mics on sale. These MXL or whatever Russian made mics, mm-hmm. and they were super sensitive because they were made for studio use, which is not what you want mm. when you're broadcasting. Um, because they're super sensitive and they pick up everything and they were omnidirectional. It was a freaking nightmare. And we used them for years because we didn't know any better. And in order to hook them up to the computer, Guitar Center had to special order an M audio interface that plugged into USB, uh, the USB port, which actually I think it might have been Firewire or something at that time. No, that was USB back then. Or, was, yeah, okay. Yeah. So there was no we, Firewire back then, yeah. We had to special order it because nobody wanted to hook up computers t- to their microphones and vice versa. It was like, what are you talking about? You want to hook up microphones to your computer? Why? <laughs> so we ordered that thing. It finally came. We brought the microphones back. We bought these cables and we plugged it in. The only recording program that could handle multiple tracks was GarageBand. And so we recorded on GarageBand and we didn't really know what we were doing or setting it up or anything. And it was it was really bad. I mean, you could hear we had to turn off the air conditioning and or the uh, furnace depending on the time of year in the basement. And we would often turn the furnace off and forget to turn it back on. And so we would go out and come home. And a couple nights, you know, we would be out like drinking or whatever. And we'd come back and I would crash in the basement. And one day I woke up and I could see my breath. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, it's so cold in here. And what had happened was we had turned the furnace off at six p.m. That was hilarious. In January of mid. <laughs> And at 4 a.m., I woke up. I was like, oh, my God, it's literally 30 degrees in here. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was, it was funny. I'm, we're lucky we didn't I can picture that. That's what's so funny about it. Yeah, and I woke up, and I was like, oh, my God. And I woke AJ up. I was like, dude, I hate to bother you. I know it's late. I mean, he's in bed with, like, his girlfriend, and I'm like, the, fir- the, the furnace is off. And he goes, oh, my God, I know it's so cold in here. And it, you know, imagine the subterranean basement type of thing. Oh, my gosh. So in those early days, were you just talking? Um, were you deciding to interview people? What was it? What did it look like? What did an episode look like? Me and him talking, and eventually yeah. we started to interview people on Skype, and it was very difficult to get that to work. It was super. In fact, to this Skype day, Skype was so buggy back. I mean, uh, alone, it was awful. And I'm still not even sure how we actually. I think we had to share a microphone because you couldn't do two channels in on Skype, which you, by the way, still can't unless you use software. And then. Um, we were interviewing people. Mostly we were just talking to each other, making dumb jokes. Editing was pretty pretty rudimentary. 
and most people weren't editing. So what we we set ourselves apart because we were editing. And, and nobody, you, these were on iTunes. These yeah. Are, these, wow. Yeah. So can you still listen to these? Can people still listen to these early we episodes? Ju- we just removed the first two hundred. Oh no! Why? They're friggin' uh, crap. You, you don't want to listen to them. Trust us. Really? <laughs> you don't. Yeah, it's they're just really bad and bad equipment, bad acoustics, bad microphone technique, mediocre guests, bad interviews, uh, and. You know, my voice is totally different. I had my tonsils out a few years after I started, so my voice changed. So it's just there's nothing really good there, and they're still on the website, but, like, we buried a lot of them. They're just not, like, they're old, you know? What was your idea back then? Like, what were you, were you just trying to help um, guys or – yeah, it was yeah. a dating show, you know. Yeah. It was about helping guys meet girls, but doing it in a nice way that wasn't sleazy. Right. Which nobody was doing at yeah. that point. You know, nobody was doing wow. that. Wow. So what's been the most embarrassing podcast moment for you? Um, There's probably a ton, but, like, I'm trying to think. I mean, just, you know, us screwing something up or not recording it or something like that, that's pretty classic. But I'm I'm pretty sure... Oh, man, I don't know. There was a time at which I was drinking during the show early <laughs> on, and I tried to sing a song from Greece. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I, good could come of that. Nothing s- good could come of that. And I did it in falsetto, and AJ was like, we got to cut that whole thing. <laughs> but it, we, would, we had an interview guest, and he was just like, are you guys okay? Do you need to reschedule? <laughs> and, um, and we managed to make it. But at, oh at that gosh. point, now anytime I'm tempted to sing anything, I just remember – that moment and it, it never yeah i haven't probably sang into a microphone oh for a gosh. decade because of that and i'm just gonna make a note this is probably all pre-jason so oh because yeah. when jason came on that's when things started to get smooth right jason well I'd, I'd like to think so but i would i would pay good money to have that grease clip yeah i will put that, well, is in that every somewhere episode. can we get that nope it's oh. gone as far as you know you, you uh, just, lost to the lost to the sands it. of time you burned it um so I want to get into the – it's almost like the PJ, like pre-Jason and post-Jason. Um, but the pre-Jason early on, what did the process look like? You know, Maybe um, as far as you – when you started to kind of get it going. So not like early, early on those first episodes, but when you actually you – know, the ones you kept on. Like you said you deleted the first 200. After the 200 – what did the flow look like? Did you have pre-interviews uh, at that time? You know, what did it look like then? PJ, pre-Jason era? Yeah, pre-Jason. So what we did, which we thought was kind of funny and silly, is uh, I, we would outline and prep. But after a while, AJ didn't really – he wasn't really interested in that because he had a ton of work. He was in a PhD program. So mm. I was doing it myself. And doing an outline and then sharing it with somebody – and getting them to follow along is very unlikely. Mm-hmm. And, and so I fought it for a while, and then I realized, you know, we do really we do better shows for just listening and reacting to the guest mm-hmm. and not trying to read certain points. You know, we could have a rough roadmap, but if I had the map, yeah, it didn't matter if he did, yeah, because he could guide the show. And that's how I learned how to guide a show. I was mm-hmm. really guiding my co-host and the guest at the same time. Yeah. When there was a guest, usually there wasn't. So I started out learning how to control show flow, just doing a show with a co-host. Most people who podcast now, I noticed if they have a co-host, there's not one person guiding it. They're kind of both trying, and that doesn't work. You Mm -hmm. actually need a show leader. Whether or not that person has to obviously be the leader is one thing. I think if you're really good, you can make it look like you're both equally doing the work, but in truth, if you're both just kind of winging it and relying on each other, like, oh, I'm going to let him know when I want to talk, it's not going to work. Mm-hmm. And you can see that. It's people struggle with that a lot. They're like, yeah, communication between us because we're co hosting. There has to be a leader. There is not another way. People who say that there are, that's great. But guess what? Howard Stern is the leader. He's got Robin, Opie, and Anthony. They seemed like they were equal, but one person was in charge. And I know this because I worked at Sirius XM. I have yeah. behind the scenes. I've seen how professionals do it. They make it look different than it is. Yeah. Somebody driving on each show. Yeah. What was Talk about some of the hires up until when Jason came on. Yeah. Um, let me see here. Great, great question. I don't know if we had anybody for a long time. Yeah, I'm, which is important to talk about. Yeah, you know? we, 
we had coaches and stuff running the programs here at Art of Charm, but we on production side, mm-hmm. we had nobody. I mean, for a while, I had a virtual assistant that would get me information. That was useless. I still don't. <laughs> oh, know. that was. We're still. We're still digging ourselves out. Really? Why? Yeah, it's just garbage. They just don't care. Yeah. They and you know, frankly, I know people that use VAs all the time and swear by them, and I've seen some of the work product, and I'm still underwhelmed. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. So what? You're paying this person five bucks an hour. You could pay somebody fifteen and get it done well, and not have to redo it next year. You know, so I'm I'm always so skeptical of that. And um, after a while, I had somebody say, "Hey, look, I'm an audio engineer, and I'd love to edit some of the shows." And I said, "No, thanks. I edit them." Mm-hmm. He said, "Yeah, that's the problem." I mean, he didn't say that. <laughs> and I was learning a lot from editing my own show. Right. And I think now the, there's a temptation for new showrunners to in hosts. To, to outsource immediately everything. outsource yeah. editing, and there's yeah. a reason they're not getting better that quickly, and it's because yeah. they're not editing out their own crap. Yeah, yeah, you got to listen to your own ums, ahs, pauses, pregnant pauses, stupid pauses, pregnant and pauses. just just stumbling over yourself, like breathing, <sighs> breathing into the microphone, doing things like that, not having good microphone technique or breath control. You understand that stuff after you've edited about like 20 right. hours of your own shows, right. and that makes you better on the microphone. Yeah, and you have to do that. Outsourcing it is a total waste of time. I mean, yeah, people are like, I want to have a podcast, but I don't want to do any of the work. Well, then you're going to have a really bad podcast. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Right. And, and so the, the counter argument is, so you mean to tell me you edit your own show? No, but I certainly audit the final product. And I don't audit all of them. I'll pick one big guest here, one person there where I think the show went well, yeah. which is how I know I can perform. And I will audit that, and I will listen and go, ooh, this should have been that way. Okay, note. All right, oh, uh, tell Jason that this, I normally don't want those in there. Oh, remind him to tell the engineer that I don't want my bass reduced like this, or I don't want him to turn this up too high. The gain's too high on this. So I'll do that occasionally, maybe once a month. I, I should be doing it every week or every other week, quite frankly. Oh, please and, don't. Please don't. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. But you get a I, slew of emails, Jason. Sorry. Well, I'm just so self-critical. Yeah. But here's the here's the here's the thing. There's a lot of people that are listening to this and our show, The Art of Charm. Yeah. And I want to get better at this. So I'm at the point where we are, are and we can talk about what we're doing to get better now. But yeah. one of the best things you can do, I I um I actually spoke with very briefly with somebody who is um. A really well known. Well, I had Larry King on the show first of all. Yeah. And I also spoke very briefly with David Letterman. And you know what they do? Really? They they painfully and painstakingly l- listen to every or watch every show that they did mm. to get better. And they di- dissected themselves. And we were talking with Dan Harris, who used to work for Peter Jennings, the newscaster. Mm-hmm. It was really hard on them. And the the reason he was is because he was infinitely harder on himself. Mm-hmm. They would High catch expectations. Him yeah, they would catch him in his office at like 2 a.m. re-watching the wow. newscast from that night for like the fifth time in a row wow. so that he could figure out where he could improve. Yeah, You don't get better when you're it's like, game tape. recorded, go ahead and edit it. That's why, because they never even hear their own final product. It's ridiculous to think they're going to learn from that. So did you bring on the audio engineer? What happened? Oh, yeah. So what happened was... Um, yeah, when Jason I, came on before I did. Yeah, he, he was did. he was there for like a couple months before I I joined up. He kept volunteering to edit the show for free, and I've, eventually I was like, all right. So I gave it to him. It was really good. Mm-hmm. That I would have done, frankly. And then so he did it for free for a really long time. And then he was like, hey, um, you know, <laughs> food. I need food. <laughs> well, I need eventually to eat. I offered. He don't even think he asked. I offered to pay yeah. him because I said, hey, we're going to be releasing two a week, and he was like, oh, I'll try to keep up. And I was like. How about I throw you some cake so that you don't have to work other jobs and you can edit? So we right. started paying him, um, and then you know we threw him some other work from other people so he could engineer full time. And then after a while, he asked for a raise, and we gave it, and da 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 da. And so he's still with us. He's been man, really, yeah. He's still the audio engineer of the show. It's been the same guy for a really long time. So yeah, at least like two years now. So early oh. on, you'd record, download to your computer, and then you do the editing. And then you'd upload it into iTunes. That was the original work. The original, flow. and now and well, then, yeah, and it, yeah, also we had our own custom plugin for WordPress, so we could dynamically insert ads. We had the first oh, really? plugin that could actually change every show. When That's we amazing. when we released a new show, we had the like literally the first 
like system to do dynamic ad insertion. Hmm. Yeah. And we ended up killing it. But yeah, that Why? was that was one Why'd of the things. So so if you use dynamic ads, yeah. the Art of Charm invented dynamic ads. Hmm. Period. Yep. And um and you know, the reason we killed it is because it was massively processed. it cost a lot to run that on Amazon's cloud. Mm. And frankly, what we found was we just needed to, we, instead of throwing old advertisers and old episodes, which is pointless. We were advertising Art of Charm products in old episodes, which is great. But yeah. we we don't come out with new products every month like a lot of internet marketers do. Right. And so we can simply tell people to go to the website to get resources, and they will. We don't mm-hmm. have to have the latest and greatest thing in every episode. Right. And um, now that we run on Libsyn and other professional hosting platforms. It's more expensive to upload new versions of the same files of the show mm-hmm. than it is just to use their dynamic ad insertion, which is yeah. not cheap. So we just decided to scrap dynamic ad insertion. Mm-hmm. We don't do it anymore. There's no reason. Yeah, yeah. We just took the the old episodes and put in evergreen ads and just let them run. So after the audio engineer, who was the next person you brought on board? At this person, are you still are you, at this point? Are you still reaching out to guests to invite them? And, totally, yeah. yeah I'm okay. still guest booking. All this is, is all me, and um, and I'm ne- re- I think the next person was the the show notes girl. Show notes, because you were still you were still running everything yourself. I was doing tech for the Art of Charm, and you were still running everything by yourself. So you brought on the show notes woman. Right, she was doing the show notes for a while. How were the show notes getting done before the woman? I wrote them. You wrote them. It's painful. Yeah. Or at least me. for me, like just actually writing. I don't know how how was it for you. I was working eighty hours a week. Yeah. I was in hell. <laughs> yeah. I was in hell. Because so how many was, episodes are you releasing at that point? One a week. One a week. If, yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a ton of work. Yeah, but but by the time I came on, you were up to three. So And you were doing yeah. show notes for all three, Jordan? I had hired a show notes gal okay. by the time. Lara Lara Laced. That was her name. She's okay. good. The only okay. reason she doesn't work with Art of Charm anymore is because I want to say because, you know, I can't even remember the reason at this point, but I know we have Bob Fogarty doing it now, and I think it's because he does a bunch of other stuff with WordPress. So he kind of yeah, he's a, he's yeah. also an editor and a writer and does a bunch mm-hmm. of other stuff with us. So it was a, it was a, a common it was it was an easy like slide in for him to do the show notes plus also doing uh, other articles and proofreading and writing for us. Yeah. yeah, it came down to like, hey, we have two part time people, one of both of whom need more hours. Or we have one guy who's doing a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff and is also a writer that we could easily have him do this other job, and it would make more sense because he's already got to listen to the show, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So we basically ended up you know, shifting everything over to him, which, which worked out really well because he was already listening to the shows for other reasons. Mm-hmm. So it just didn't make any sense. And, um, and yeah, we, we made sure she landed on her feet with other clients and stuff like that, of course. But, um, yeah, we... We were we were very surprised that we had now now at this point I've got an audio engineer, mm-hmm. show notes guy, and yep. an executive producer. And of course Jason's job as executive producer is to make sure that everything works so that I can take naps. Yeah, so when so I don't get naps, but he does. Was yeah. the next after the show notes was it was Jason were you, is that when you came I, on I came as executive on, I came producer? on before I well I came on before Fogarty came on. So okay. it was uh, we we would just started doing Fan Mail Fridays, okay. which was our our you know we were doing three shows a week yeah. for a bit, and I'm so a, I, I was already a podcaster for a couple of years on my mm-hmm. own show, and then I was but I was doing tech for AOC. I was running the website stuff, writing uh, custom software, doing the WordPress WordPress stuff, yeah. and keeping the servers running. Yeah, and then we ended up outsourcing a lot of that to a different team, yeah. and from that point we're like, well, guess I'm gone, <laughs> and then Jordan's like. No, I mean, why don't you roll in to help me with the podcast? Because yeah. I can't sleep. I'm doing this all by myself. And I'm right. like, okay, that sounds great. Right. And so I moved into the producer role on the podcast at that point. And then I brought in Fogarty to do a bunch of the other stuff because we were swapping out writers and stuff. And that's when I took over. It was about a year ago. It's, it's, it's really hmm. close to about a year ago. So what, Jordan, what did you want Jason to do? As the executive producer, and then what is a what is that? How did that turn in, involved in what he does now? Sure. So what I wanted was somebody who would reach out, get the guests, call them, make sure they were fit to print, so to speak, mm-hmm. fit to air, mm-hmm. get the prep to them, get the prep back from them, make sure they were advancing through the guest advance funnel, which is the the thing we used to screen out the Yutzi people and <laughs> going to cut 
you know, cut rope. Right. And then, um, also to get the text set up, get the files in order, get the files to the editor with instructions on what needs to be cut slash left, where things need to be moved to. Yeah. And also, I need someone to coordinate my advertising because we have ads on every episode. Yeah. We have we sell out our ad inventory a few months in advance. Yeah, to go in each show, they have to be in specific places. If we screw something up, they have to be redone and they have to be inserted by the engineer or by Jason, yeah. uh, by the executive producer. Yeah, I can't do any of that. I don't have time. Right. And I I don't if, know how Jason has time, but that sounds like a lot of stuff. Well, he outsources show okay. notes to. The editor, the yeah. posting to the to the um, assistant producer Bob Fogarty. Yeah, assistant producer handles a lot of that, and the audio engineer does the edits, and then Jason QCs quality controls the whole thing yeah. to make sure it's up to AOC standards. My job can only be to prepare for the show and talk. I after that I cannot yeah. even think about it. If I'm thinking, yeah. about, it means that the next show is not being prepared for. Yeah, just to give people an idea, at what year were you able to do just your just that? 2015 probably right yeah. Jason yeah no it, it, so it took almost us 10 about, years nine years yeah. yeah yeah no I mean what he was doing was killing him so that's yeah. why we had to really kind of back it off because it was just it's too much work for one person yeah. hell it's too much work for four people right <laughs> at this it point is. so we you know we backed him off as much as possible and got him just so he could prepare for the show and be the host that's what Jordan's job is Jordan's yeah. job is to be the host and do an amazing interview yeah that's it I don't want him to focus on anything else ads I take care of I handle QC I handle show notes prepping everything dealing with the editors dealing with the advertisers all of yeah. that stuff and also guest booking doing doing phone calls with the guests making mm -hmm. sure that they're like you know ready to come on the show and there are a lot of guests that you know could be some of the most amazing smart people in the world, but they can't put a sentence together on a microphone, yeah. and we have to cut them. It's a different you know? skill. Yeah, we, yeah, it's a completely hard, different skill. We found it out the hard way because Jason, uh, you were probably doing tech still for this, but we still find it out, right? We still find it out the easy way because we'll be like, "Oh wow, this is so good. This book is amazing. Have mm -hmm. you read this? Yeah, it's so good. Oh my God, we got to get this author on, and then we'll do the pre-interview, and I'm like, "Is this guy?" Does he have a pulse? What is exactly? That? You know, it's and we'll, we'll even say things like, "Do you need to reschedule? Is everything okay over there?" And they like, "Some coffee or some jumping yeah. jacks." Or Just play the Magnum PI song; and they'll perk right up. You know, and we're saying things like "Hello," and the person's like, "Yeah, I'm still here." And it's like, "Are uh, you sure?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, seriously, you might be there, but you're not here. <laughs> that's that's kind of how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> that solves all awkward silences. Megan it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we've also had people that come on and do our pre-interviews who are dynamic in the pre-interview. Yeah. And then when they show up for the show, we're, we're poking a corpse. Really? You know, that's, that's, yeah. it's, it it's happens. Nerves? Why is that? No, you know what it is? These guys who – people are not – there's a reason that people in showbiz and performers do better interviews. And it's because they understand it's a performance. Mm. And – if you're the CEO of a company and you wrote a book, the way that you handle these interviews is you go into what you think is a quiet conference room with a microphone you just got at Best Buy and you're broadcasting on the company Wi-Fi. Right, right. And I can hear all the background noise. People are calling you. The conference room phone is ringing because somebody has the wrong number. People are trying to find you. Your BlackBerry is going off. Somebody's coming in to tell you you only have 10 minutes till the next one because you booked three days to get all these interviews done for your book, like a task, not a performance. And your Wi Fi is cutting in and out. Meanwhile, you're saying, This never happens. Skype's been fine all day. And it hasn't. <laughs> Just that the other right. don't care enough. And, and otherwise, they're like, oh, I usually do these by phone, which sucks also, but they don't know the difference. Right. So these are the kind of things that you deal with. And so when you do the pre-interview and he's at home or he's you know hanging out in his car on a lunch break or something like that, or he's in his quiet office on a quiet day, you think, wow, this guy's going to kill it. When it's interview number six and they're not seasoned performers, they're not seasoned interviewees, yeah. They don't realize how friggin' tired they're going to be. Yeah. So you do a show with this person, and you think, this was utter rubbish. Yeah. And Please. you also have to factor in time of day, too, which is something that we finally started to actually schedule for because mm -hmm. people at the end of the day on the East Coast, because we're on the West Coast, yeah. you know, not realizing that, oh, 8 o'clock on uh, you know, East Coast time, 
they're fried. They're done yeah. for the day. Yeah, they do done. not schedule shows like that late in the day anymore because that's what happens. They're fried. They're done. Do you yeah. know, they're burnt. So you yeah. have to you have to factor in energy levels, time of day, you know, the minutia of what it takes to get a good interview. Howard Stern, that's why he records in the morning. Well, I mean, granted it was a morning show, but still it's like everybody's on point, you know, yeah. everybody's ready to go. But at eight o'clock on a you know, a Thursday, people are just like, I just want to watch Magnum PI. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, nobody wants to do a show on Friday. That's why we don't do them. Nobody wants to do a show in the evening. And if you do them on Mondays, people are harried because they just got 87 emails about how their house is on fire. Yeah. So they can't focus. There's a lot of things that go into getting an, a great interview guest and yeah. having them do a good job that is completely within your control. Yeah. Of course, there's tons of stuff that's outside your control, yeah. but we can't really worry about that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we only focus on what's in our control. But I'll be I'll be honest. You still I'm still finding things where we're like, OK, that's it. No more X, Y, Z type things mm -hmm. every, every now, week, every single what's week. This, what's been this week? Huh? Or, or last week? Uh, no repeat guests. No repeat guests. Well, no, re re repeat guests who didn't make it the first time and we give them a second chance. Mm. Yes, no second so sometimes, chance. Yeah, sometimes it happens where somebody could be off and we're like, okay, we'll give you another shot. And then they come back and they do the exact same show. So no more repeat guests. If they failed the first time, they're going to fail the second time. Yeah. Just, you, have to, you have to factor that in. And it sucks because a lot of these people are really nice. They have really good messages, but they're not good podcast guests. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that... You have your rules now it, throughout the years. It's a rule, but it's yeah. it's also like, look, you you can have – I don't want it to be like, damn, if you screw up with Jordan Harbinger, he's never going to talk to you again. It's but not it's like true. That. It's it's – I will give you another shot, but I want you to wait a year because, look, you're not going to get that much better at being a guest in, in three, three weeks. weeks. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to happen. Oh, you know, I just didn't know what kind of content you wanted. No, if it's not that. It's really, it's not. It's you think it's that, and the fact that you think it's that makes you even less likely to be really good on the show. So, if you, you did a post yeah. Jordan Jason rules, what would what would like the top five be? Um, Jordan, you want to go first? First thing is, no, you can't do it on your phone. Yes, the <laughs> does sound different. Okay. And no Apple earbuds. No Apple earbuds. But I'll tell you what. The reason the phone is bad is not just because phone quality is bad. In fact, for many new smartphones, I'm sure the quality is quote-unquote HD, right? Right. But the reason is not that. The reason is if you're on the phone, you're doing a thousand other things or you have yeah. the option to do a thousand other things. You're just having what in your mind is a phone conversation. Yeah. If you are in a studio – and you're in front of a microphone, suddenly Ish just got real, right? Yeah. Your show. I don't want you walking around your kitchen to get a snack <laughs> because you think I can't hear it. I can hear it. Right. I you know the, the reason you're not able to come up with a quick response to my question is because you're trying to remember where you put the freaking Cheetos. Right. I Dude, we've had so many people eating potato chips on the show. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You have no idea. Trust me, you have no idea the caliber of people who will eat potato chips while they're doing a professional interview. It's yeah. crazy. It's really nuts. And you're thinking, this person was in charge of this? This is an A-list, you know, da-da-da-da? Right. I can't believe it. This is a person with $100 million in the bank, and they're freaking munching on, you know, sun chips? Get out of here. And so you can't do that. People will do that on the phone, and there's an argument like, oh, they're more relaxed that way. I don't really need them to be that relaxed. I right. want them to no. yeah. open Seriously. up, but I don't want them to be relaxed. I want them to be on their toes. And oh, yeah, they need to be focused. Yeah. Focused, yeah. And people who listen to AOC know I keep I keep fools on their toes. That's how I roll. Yeah. Um and so no phoners for those multiple reasons. No Apple earbuds as many ways as we can, simply because they rub against clothing and they rub against It's annoying. Clothing. Yeah. You can't hear it when you're listening because it's a, the microphone doesn't feed back through the headphones. So you think it sounds fine, but really it's going and it's just, I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. yeah. And so we've actually started we, – we have a set of microphones that we will send out to guests if, if all they have is Apple earbuds, you know, yeah. and oh, that's nice. all they have. We'll send them a microphone. They can use it for the show and send it back to us. Or and, they, if they're, and if they're a really good guest, they can keep it. Yeah. yeah. It's AOC branded. It's a nice USB mic. It's real good. Salad. Um, the other thing is we nobody can skip the prep. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody. Do not, we do not allow it. The reason is because a lot of these people go, 
I've done this a million times. I don't need prep. And then we call them and they're in the friggin' sounds like they're in the bathtub. And we're like, what? This is the only room. And I do things in here all the time. Nobody's ever complained. Well, you're used to doing phoners for crappy third rate AM radio. And that is not going to fly. Or you're so famous, nobody's ever had the heart to tell you your sound quality stinks. Yeah, that's probably more of what it is. And yeah. and that's that's not going to fly with us. So we don't allow that. You have to do the pre-interview call in the same place where you're going to be, and you've got to send us the prep. And part of the reason that we also enforce the prep is, you know, people used to give me crap all the time, like, I don't, I'm not going to do prep. You know, you should do your own homework. I'm literally just making sure that you care enough to actually invest in the show. Right. If you don't, you're just going to show up and wing it, and I don't need that from you. Yeah. I If you can't even be bothered to send me your bio, and look, if yes, it may be your assistant. That's fine. I get it. But at least you have people that are going to make sure you don't sound like crap. And the truth is, people who don't want to do prep, I've heard this argument before. They go, I'm a pro. I don't do prep. You know who does prep? Howard Stern. Pros do prep. Pros, Pros do prep. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Pros, the, the amateurs do a lot of prep because they want to make sure, beginners, I should say, do a lot of prep because they want to make sure things go well. Yeah. Amateurs think they've outgrown it, and pros realize you cannot do without it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, it's, you know, we with the prep, it's we need to make sure that we're all on the same page for the show because we need to know that what they're delivering is a good match for our audience as well as theirs mm -hmm. yeah. because if it's not a good match for our audience, we don't want them. Seriously, we don't want them. Yeah. And that's, that's seriously it because we want to have as much value for our, our audience as well as their audience. We want to get something out of them that they haven't had before. Jason, what, what's the biggest correction you have to make during the prep for people? Uh, can you can you ask that again? My What's the biggest correction crazy. that you have to make during the prep session for them that if you didn't tell them it would have just been disaster? Uh, well, we get a lot of prep back that says uh, I'm going to talk about the five things to do X, and I'm like, okay, well, what are those five things? You know, they they just say they kind of do an outline of what they're going to talk about, but they don't go into specifics. Mm -hmm. We 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 require them to go into specifics mm -hmm. because then we can look at it and say, well. If you're going to tell us, you know, the five steps to being successful as an entrepreneur is, A, make your bed in the morning. Okay? Yeah. You're off the show. Period. Yeah. If, if you come to us and say – Or you put them on I'm the gonna... show and just watch Jordan rip into them. No, no, no. I'm Honest. the one that rips into him. Jordan yeah. doesn't. Jordan, Jordan just rolls his eyes. If you tell me about the story about the Mexican fisherman who's, you know, catching fish and then the businessman says, well, you can become this great fisherman right, and then right. – Start the company and then go back to exactly where you are. You're off the show. There yeah. are a lot of there are a lot of like catch all things that we look for in, mm -hmm. in that in the prep. Yeah. So that's why we make sure that they they have to like line item everything so we know what we're, they're they're going to talk about. So we're not caught off guard and we're mm -hmm. we're still providing value for the audience, but we're also not wasting our time and their time mm -hmm. yeah. because you know there are plenty of shows that they can go on that maybe those people have never heard that story before, but on our show. We've had enough high quality guests where these people know these stories. And it's just right. like if, if you get up in the morning and you make your bed, you're going to be successful. Well, that's not ag exactly true. We've all seen the commencement speech. Let's move on and find something actually interesting. Let's talk about some science behind like, you know, what's going to make you a better person. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where we really draw the line. Yeah. It's like there's some sort of weird thought leader school where beginners go, okay, I'm going to pick my three cliched stories that I tell everyone. Right. I pick one weird anecdote that makes me sound like I came back from something. And some of these people really have, but a lot of it is just like really hyped up. Mm -hmm. and it's no sense. And then we're going to talk about how somehow my new product magically fits into personal growth and self-improvement or and or make a wildly unsupported claim mm -hmm. uh, a, a, like a wildly i shouldn't say um some sort of outrageous claim that is completely unsupported by any science whatsoever like like 10,000 hours will make you an expert 10,000 hours will make you an expert visualization is the key and science shows it no and no right <laughs> And yeah. anybody who's read one book on brain science that's not the one that came up with that rule knows this. And so what it says to me is you're, you're so in the beginning of what this career might be that you haven't really bothered to even vet what you're teaching. And we cannot feed our audience crap. The, the way that we look at it is 
the AOC family, we don't even say audience, we say AOC family, the way we, we deal with this is that we treat them like we would treat people that are members of our own family in that we don't feed them horse crap. Right. Because, and tell them it's steak because that's what a lot of guests will try to do. We don't get them to buy things that are rubbish. We don't allow them to even be exposed to things we think are dangerous or snake oil. And if we, we can help it. If we can help it. And we always argue with people that we think are wrong. It's yeah. not that hard, but right. most hosts will never bother because it's actually something that requires you to have a little bit of uh, – of hair on your chest. Yeah, it's confrontational. Whatever. It's confrontational. Well, what was the, yeah, what was the really good one, Jordan, that you had where the guy was like, go outside, take your shoes off, and get grounded with the earth, and you will get magnetism through your feet. Remember that guy? You I totally did. took him to task. I did. He's actually, it's funny. Was this in the prep or the actual interview? Oh, this was, was on the show. Oh. And I didn't see it coming. And it's a good friend of mine who's a, he's a chiropractor, Jeremy. And, um, Weirdos. Weirdos. <laughs> and, uh, Jeremy's a chiropractor, Jason. I don't have to do that. And um, he, he's, uh, he mentioned this, and I said straight up, that sounds like complete bullshit. <laughs> and he laughed, and then he tried to defend it. And I looked it up later on Fan Mail Friday because somebody wrote in and was like, thank you for saying this is BS. Turns out. Science behind it is pretty weak. Right, right. And um, so we shot a hole in it. And th- here's the problem with not challenging guests. Yeah. It, it, well, p- let me let me start start this way. When you challenge guests, a lot of times people find it uncomfortable. I got an email a couple of months ago. Oh man, you know, Jordan, we know you're smart. You don't have to prove it by arguing with people. And I explained to him exactly what I'm explaining to you, which is that it's my job. My duty is much stronger to the audience and AOC family right. than is to anybody who's a guest on the show. Yeah. You're a guest in my house, and I have my kids seated around listening to you. Right, right. I will be polite and respectful, but at some point, I'm calling you on. <laughs> and, and it's a good way of looking at it, yeah. Yeah, it's a way that we do look at it. And so what what happened was when I when you know he came out with that, it was like, look, you know, I have to challenge you on this. I'm being irresponsible if I don't. And so we did. We challenged him on it and and it I think we did rightfully so. Now, if you don't challenge your guest and somebody hears something that they think is crap, yeah. they're going to simply think that everything that's on your show is mm-hmm. equal of equal credibility yeah. or that everything that guest says is of equal credibility. If I challenge a guest on something and I don't challenge them on other things and those then what the listener is free to infer is that the things I didn't challenge may actually be true or at least I be, believe them to be so. Right. Whereas the thing I challenge is just the thing I challenge. So it's actually a favor to the guest to challenge yeah. them because what it means is hey look I like nine out of the thing, ten things you're saying, but this one, this is bullshit. And yeah, that's because otherwise it's an implicit endorsement. Yeah. yeah. It's an implicit endorsement, and otherwise maybe everything that the guest says is bullshit. <laughs> and that's not good. That makes the guests look bad, and they completely wasted their time coming on the show and, frankly, have humiliated themselves. So you're doing everyone a favor, both audience and guest, when you challenge them. In fact, if somebody's coming on a show and they're saying something that is complete BS – they should know so they don't embarrass themselves in the future. They should change the way they present unless they can defend what they're presenting. And most of these people, they have never had anybody challenge them on anything. They wrote a book about it. They don't have science behind it. There's some self-help motivational speaker. This stuff is weak. And yeah. I'm here to separate the snake oil from the real deal. That's my whole job. Do you ever challenge people, even though you agree with them, but think from the audience like well they may think this is really strange so i should challenge them on it all the time yeah. I, absolutely yeah totally we had uh we had a uh, a woman from the navy she's a 30-year veteran and a pilot and jordan just laid into her at the beginning of the interview he's like why why do we care what you say and she just came back at him with all of her credentials and she's like that's why right and that right. you know it also helps when you have a really good guest like that who knows their stuff they're like they're not phased by that Makes they're like stronger. you know what yeah, yeah they're like oh well this is why because i know my stuff i've spent 30 years doing it you know and that kind of thing when when we get guests on and we just challenge them out of the gate and we you know we let them know that they're going to they're going to get some flack from us but if they can step it up and that just gives them credibility. It gives us credibility, and it makes the show better, and it's more yeah. enjoyable for the audience. Yeah. And I, go I've ahead. Never had a guest at the end of the show say, "Man, you were really hard on me. That was that was that sucked." I've I've had a couple of different responses. One was, 
I'm so sorry. You're right. I never actually bothered to look and see if that was true. Yeah. Should we re-record that or do you want to cut it out? And the answer is no, we did our job because I challenged you on it. And it's fine. Right. The, other, the other and very much more common response is, you know what? Thank you. I, no one has ever mentioned that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to iron this out and see if this is something I need to keep teaching because I didn't know that you blah, blah, blah. Because I, I don't just say that's a bunch of BS. I say, actually, science has proven this wrong in the recent decade. Maybe it's been a while since you've crafted, you've crafted this or created this speech. Why don't we have a look at it? And I almost always get a thank you. And it's not an on-air kiss Jordan's butt thank you. It's an right. email two days later. Oh, my God, you're right. It's completely false. Right. Or, or even after the show, you know what? It's great. Nobody's ever made me think about things this way because they usually just take whatever it is that this person says on stage and go, yay, golf clap, and then the person goes on the way. They never have <laughs> made good content. Yeah, they have to change their curriculum. You know, for people doing it themselves, Jason, what's the hardest part about your job if they're doing uh, all that stuff that you do by themselves? Um, the hardest part is just yeah. it's keeping all the balls in the air. That's honestly it. It's, you know... I'm dealing with my inbox has 450 emails. We've got guest suggestions all the time, wow. plus dealing with ads, air checks with, you know, advertisers, dealing with managing the show notes guys, managing the editors, spot checking everything, making sure everything's where it needs to be. It's, you know, it's a it's a double full-time job. Yeah. Jordan, what about you? What's what's the toughest job now that you are really focused in on what you do best? For me, it's the well, the toughest part is is distraction and on um, and things taking my attention away because the way that part of the prep that we do it's so exhaustive that it, it just takes a ton of time and one of the things that sets the show apart is not only the skill of the production team and things like that but the fact is nobody's willing to put the amount of work in yeah. that we are on our end because there's that's just why no I wanted to hear this from you you know because people don't realize they just think you just kind of post it online and just record it but there's so much that goes in to yeah. just once even it goes on your site there is and and a lot of people i'm sure think oh art of charm they were first to market they've been doing it for so long so they have a big audience no way i mean who is who is in the in the space in 2006 do you even remember who uh, else was there? i've i can name anyone one. still around one person, Emily Morse, she runs a show called Sex with Emily. She was one of the other ones in our category yeah. that I saw. Yeah. And she was she had a radio show. She was on Love Line with Dr. Drew. So she was like, Oh, podcasting, it's a natural extension. Mm -hmm. She's in LA. I don't even know how she got wind of it. Her agent must have known about it. So they yeah. uploaded part of that stuff as a podcast and boom. Everybody else is gone. I mean, this is back in the days of like people who are old school aficionados. They remember there were only so many podcasts. There was like Tiki Bar TV, which was like this weird play that taught you to make drinks or something. Okay. And I mean, there was just not a whole lot in there. There were something like there were something like 300 or 800 podcasts in iTunes and we yeah. thought, "Oh my god, no one's ever going to find us in all these." Now there's <laughs> 7,000 more. What did you learn from Sirius? Sirius was great because this was immediate playing with the big boys. Yeah. Uh, it was live, first of all. So yeah. there was no like, oh, sorry, I'm late. Or, the guest didn't show up. We don't know what to do now. This is live radio. Mm. It's all over the U.S. and Canada. And we were on Maxim Radio, which is now called Stars 2 or Indie. And so it was big. People were listening. And we were the lead into the biggest show on that station. We were on right before them. So... It was it was crazy. We show up. We had to get guests. We had to figure out how to deal with them. Weird stuff happens on live radio. And instead of doing it in a in an apartment with a throw rug, <laughs> to a skyscraper in Times Square with a photo ID, right? Going all the way up to the top floor where Howard Stern works, right next to us, walking through, and you're like, oh, there's Paul McCartney. Oh, there's the mm. mayor. And I mean, this is regular. That's sweet. Look, yeah. walk, like Iron Maiden is in studio today. And you'd go and you'd walk by. We had a big um, glass box in the lobby, which is a studio that had a ton of instruments and grand pianos. So you'd have concerts in there. Really? And you, you just kind of walk in and you're like, who's who's in there? Oh, Coldplay? Cool, man. And wow. you just walk on and do your show. And Because um, you're doing this while you're doing the podcast too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Same time. Yeah. And so we'd be in studio – and my producer would look up and go, oh, man, look, 
there's na- name some crazy, ridiculous, famous person like walking by. Snoop Dogg. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Snoop Dogg, Eminem would walk by the door, and I'd be like, "Oh, uh, let's take a break," and I'd <laughs> out and try to get him to like come to the show for five minutes or something. Doctor, would you sign my butt, please? <laughs> yeah, stuff like I mean, it's ridiculous. And I'd be sitting there checking my email between, you know, I'd try to. I, they made me record some commercials or something, so I'd be up there checking my email. And the guy next to me would be like, uh, is your internet slow? And I'd turn around and it would be like some, you know, agent waiting for his client or somebody, the guy who's like the number one electronic music DJ at the time. You know, those guys are just standing there yeah. waiting for somebody else, but he wanted to check his email. And this is early, so he didn't have a smartphone or something. I mean, literally, I remember hanging out after a show, grabbing a drink in the lobby with some other people and I went to the bathroom and I came out and there's AJ talking to Warren G. Nice. I, cool. And he's like, don't say regulator. Because I <laughs> <laughs> but he was kind of in a bad mood and AJ's like, you're going to get punched in the throat if you do that. So he texted me while I was in the bathroom. Warren G is here. Do not say regulators. And I'm like, uh, okay. <sighs> I mean, it was really cool because we had live radio, great equipment, a professional producer for yeah. the first time ever that was making sure things were running. And we were rocking, man. And we had guests like Brett Michaels from Poison. And they'd mm. be like, hey, Pablo Francisco, comedian, he wants to stomp in. He's doing something. Do you want to do a drop-in with Pablo Francisco? So we'd be flexible enough to drop everything that we were doing. And we would make a prank call with, like, Pablo Francisco wow. imitating somebody. And then he would do an ad for our show in the movie guy voice and run to you know, another studio and do his show. And That's amazing. That yeah. was what we were doing. So when we finally left Sirius XM yeah. after about three and a half years, we were like, we can't just do this friggin' podcast yeah. in my bedroom again. You knew you had to step it up after yeah. doing that, yeah. Yeah, and we knew we had it in us because we're like, look, we just hung out in, in, at the time, the, the best place to do radio anywhere in America and Canada for that matter. And aside from like being a top FM morning show in New York or whatever, you know, we were we were working next door to Howard freaking Stern yeah. and, and Anthony and all those guys. And we're sitting there and we're thinking, these people let us work here. We obviously are showing some promise. And that was years ago, man. That was six years ago, so five years ago now. So imagine imagine how far we've come since then. We just started thinking about it like real radio, not oh, I do this show as a hobby, which is what we used to think about. Yeah. That's how to run it, the, this stuff. So I want to talk to both of you about one of those times where everything kind of just flowed. And Cal Newport, talk to me about from choosing him to getting him, inviting him to researching. Tell me about from the beginning when you decided you're going to have Cal Newport on. Jason? Well, I think we're both huge fans of his, his work. Yeah. So that really helps. Um, so Good They Can't Ignore You was the first book that yeah. I read by him. And this was before his new one came out, Deep Work, which okay. is fantastic. I haven't listened to that one. Yeah, I'm going to have to write that down. Thank you. Yeah. No, yeah. If, you, if, if you remember the life before the internet, which <laughs> not very many people do anymore, but old people like me, we definitely do remember that. Uh, you used to be able to sit down and, and work for hours on end and be focused and yeah. be able to do great stuff. And so... Jordan and I both love Cal Newport, yeah. but Jordan reached out to him and finally got a hold of him because he's extremely hard to get a hold of. Mm. And now, you know, we had him had him come on the show and we were both like experts in his his work. So we put in a ton of time doing prep for that show. Yeah. We both read his books and we had a ton of questions. And so that kind of, you know, that kind of dedication to a guest is really what makes a great show. Yeah. And and. You know, Jordan puts in his time to really get deep on these guests now. And it, it, it's the difference between because most interviewers don't read the books. They don't go see yeah, the movies. They don't, you know, they read the synopsis that the publisher gives them. You get a one, I, you know, I get 30 books a week now from every wow, publisher really? on the planet. Holy yeah. Cow. Yeah. And most of them are junk. But <laughs> you get these like one and a half page synopsis of the book. And, you know, before we started to go really deep and figure out, like, who are the great guests, yeah. we would just read, you read the first chapter, you look at the table of contents, and then you can craft a show around it that's not that good. Yeah. But when, when there's somebody that's really excellent, like Cal, that comes on, you do your work, you do your time. We did the same thing with Dan Harris. Yeah. And we've got some shows coming up that we're doing exactly the same thing for. You know, it's like we only have guests now that we really want to talk to yeah. and really understand their work and, and are fans of their work. 
And so when Cal came on, we had one of the greatest conversations. And now, Jordan, you, you and Cal are friends now, right? You talk yeah. all the time. Yeah, we talk. Yeah. I, I mean, for, it's funny because I used to email him a bunch and ask him questions. And then I read Deep Work recently. Yeah. It was like, because I read his other stuff before. And he replies and I go, wow, I have a lot more respect for this incoming email, having read a book about how you just don't screw with any of this stuff. Right. You know, and, and so it's it's kind of cool to see. And frankly, one of the coolest things about the Cal Newport original episode yeah. is finally getting a hold of him because I realized yeah, he was- Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah. I mean, finally getting a hold of him- How many emails did it take? Oh, we had interns going after him and email and Twitter and da-da before we realized he wasn't on any of that stuff. Finally, he replies- and I get him on the phone to do the pre-interview, and he goes, first of all, I just want to say I'm really honored because I'm a huge fan and I listen all the time. Wow. And my head fell off and rolled yeah, across. Yeah, both of us, like, our jaws dropped. We're like, we're on Slack going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. That's yeah, awesome. I was like, I hope you recorded that, you know, because I was <laughs> so stoked right. that this guy, you know, and, and the more – the, Huge the more I, I hear about it, the more I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. And frankly, the – I even see this now. I mean, I talk with people like Larry King, uh, who we mentioned earlier. Yeah. And this is a person who's just he's busy and he's old and uh, old hat in the game. And mm -hmm. you know, he's like, "Norm sent me your show." Norm Pat is the owner of Podcast One, who's also one of the great radio personalities. I mean, he started he founded Westwood One. He founded you know? Westwood wow. One, which is basically like Clear Channel. Uh, Jeez, back in the day. that's crazy. And I got an email from Norm. Uh, it, and I thought it was like, oh, he's introducing himself to me because I'm relatively new in the network. And he writes, clearly it's written on a BlackBerry or something like that or a mobile device. And he wrote, hey, I was driving all the way from L.A. to, I can't remember. Santa like, Barbara. Santa Barbara. And he yeah. goes, I listened to your show the entire way. Wow. You guys really know what you're doing. And I just thought, I emailed the COO of Podcast One to make sure he wasn't screwing with me. And I was like, does he write this to everybody? Because... This is pretty exciting. I mean, right. this is, he's been in radio for a really long Huge time. Compliment. And the fact that he is giving us props when he's got actual celebrities on his network means a lot to us if it's real. And he was like, wow, I've never seen this. This is definitely real. It's definitely from him. And he went and talked to him. And the guy, the guy's a real big supporter. And so that's those little things are kind of like, oh, my gosh, right. we're on to something. Look, we've got two million downloads a month. That feels good. But there's something to be said for somebody who really knows what the hell they're talking about coming over and saying you should be this should be more popular than it is. You have a bright future. There's something about that that is very, very encouraging that just cannot be replaced. Yeah, I want to highlight how much work goes into this, and I want to get a little granular. You know, so you send you know dozens of emails, social net, you know, social media to Cal. Then you you send him a link, and he gets on your schedule. So both of you are you both of you on for the prep, or how does that work? Uh, Cal know. was a little bit different because okay. we did all the prep ourselves. Okay. Most guests, we like we talked about before, we require them to do prep. Yeah. But with Cal, we 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 you sent him our read all our, his we, books and everything. We read his books. We sent him the prep doc, and he 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 filled it out and sent it back. And then, but we also knew already what we wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. So it was it was kind of a collaboration at that point. So you know, some of the bigger name guests will just do all the prep, but yeah, with Cal, There's it so was it was it was a total collaboration. There. Yeah. You know? So when he comes on and you're prepping, are both of you on and then do you immediately record the episode after the prep or do you schedule a separate time for the for the episode? Well, we're we're booked out several months in advance. So oh. prep happens months beforehand. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So and, they, and they prep and then you send them a uh, link to schedule on the for the actual recording. Yes. Okay. Yes. And and a lot of a lot of other guests like not like the Cal Newports, but guests who we don't know who have been suggested to us, I will get on a phone call with them. I'll send them a pre-call prep doc. Hmm. They'll will, they will put the bullet points into the prep doc about what we're going to talk about on the pre-call to find out if they can put a sentence together and right. figure out if they have the right tech and, and know, what, know their, if they've got the right domain knowledge. And then I'll, I will send that on to Jordan after I do the pre-call and we'll kind of collaborate on that and figure out what we need to do and have them elaborate on. If there's anything that they need to elaborate on, sometimes it's perfect. And then we just book the show and then do the show. So that's kind of how that process works. Yeah. And then, Jordan, so you get on with Kel. What do you have in front of you? Do you have like a, like a Google Doc? Do you have a screen of notes? What are you looking at? Yeah, I've got our Evernote bank, okay. which is my prep plus the guest's prep. Mm-hmm. 
hybrid because okay. I have my own prep and I organize it completely differently. And usually I throw out a good chunk of what the guest has provided. Um, it depends on the guest, but a lot of that usually revolves around what they want to tell us. Yeah. And I've got my prep that tells me what they're going to tell us. It's like <laughs> you the know? dark web. Uh, yeah. yeah. Called the We're, dark web prep. Their prep might be like, and this is where my new survival kit thing fits in. And my new product <laughs> is this. And this is the five things that will get you the best results with my new product. And I'm like, okay, delete, 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 delete. Were you really a teenage mother? <laughs> Right, what? right, so right. Let's catch people off guard with that because I don't want to hear about their new thing. So a lot of times, for example, going back to Cal, I would love to talk to him about his books. Um, same with uh, pretty much a lot of really great authors will write something amazing and I want to talk about it. There's also a huge bank of people that have a book that I'm completely uninterested in. Yeah. Uh, Tony Robbins wrote a book about money. Sorry, dude, you're rich, but it's not because you're good at managing your money. Uh, and there's people quoted Firewalk, in the book. yeah, let's yeah. go. Yeah, there's people quoted in the book that I would love to talk to. However, if I'm going to talk to you, it's not going to be about that. And I won't mm -hmm. tell what, what it's about, but it's going to be something completely different. And, um, you know, same thing with any real celebrity type personality. They might be coming. They have an agenda. They have an agenda, yeah. and I'm completely not interested in that. However, yeah. The reason they're coming on the show is to talk. Their agenda has to be supported to a degree. But right. if, you're, if you're a good enough host, you can steer away from it. They'll have a great time. And then you just go, thanks, Angelina Jolie. By the way, everybody donate to the Red Cross. Anyway, thanks again for your time. And it's totally fine. Right. And that's I think one of, I, Yeah, I think one of our, my favorite episodes we did was with uh, Steve Rombaum. Steve Because we did – yeah, Steve Rombaum. He's a Check private it. investigator out okay. of New York. And we did a lot of – well, I personally did a lot of deep research on him, and we pulled out some stories. He's just like, how did you know about that? Right. Like when he was in Texas, like getting uh, – they weren't cattle wranglers, but they were people who were stealing like farm equipment when he just got into being a private eye. And he's like, nobody knows about that story. How do you guys know about that story? It's like you That's know, when, you when know we you do the great deep job. research. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So are you on the line, Jason, with Jordan during the, the interviews, or is that – on Fridays, yeah. you are. No, yeah, I'm on. I'm on every show. Every show. I'm, okay. I'm usually. I'm the Cyrano de Bergerac in Slack behind the scenes. Okay. And then, how do you actually record the episode? What do you use? What software do you guys use? Tools? Logic. We've, yeah, we've just changed up the system. I'm in. I'm in Los Angeles. Jordan's in San Jose. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a studio down here with two rack mounted Mac Minis who are Skype that, that are our Skype machines. I've got a, a three RE twenty sevens for like people in the in the studio but i record everything in logic on my side with I, I record the guest myself and jordan but then jordan records his end so we do a double ender so he sends me his files mm -hmm. and then then our engineer jason sanderson um puts them all together and does the final edit on it so do you guys then upload it somewhere for the the audio engineer where does it dropbox. go yeah, dropbox yeah everything's yeah we have a very um a very systematized uh, workflow that goes with Dropbox. We've got all all prenamed folders. Like we got source files, we got notes, we got artwork, we got finals, all and all sorts of different things. Where we everything is systematized. Where we have a a, a consistent. That's workflow. why I'm talking to you guys. Yeah. yeah. So it goes. No, that's in, the, that was yeah. that was my first job when I came on. Yeah. I built this entire workflow. Okay. So because before it was just like, oh, here's a folder with some audio. Make it make it work. <laughs> right. So, so what I did you? Yeah. Tell me about the workflow that you built. Okay, so the workflow I'm I'm pulling it up right now. So we yeah. have we have a multiple tiered system here. We've got like an episodes folder, we've got yeah. personal folders, um, an assets folder, and a miscellaneous folder. But every show has its its date date plus host. Okay. Or, or date date plus guest. Yeah. And because when we do the show, we assign a date for that guest. Yeah. And then inside that folder, we have uh, we have a source folder, which is where Jordan's files go my files go yeah. all of our logic files because we're both recording in logic right ads so we have a folder for any ad that goes in that show and they're 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 line itemed by this mid 1a mid 1b mid 2 post roll yeah. pre-roll yeah and then we also have an air checks folder because when we do ads we also need air checks for the advertisers so when so they can go back and hear the ads yeah so we have to send those to whichever ad provider wants them that week yeah um we have a notes folder for the show notes guy so we do a basic bounce right out of logic i'll do a bounce on my end to get it to bob our show notes guy who can then listen to the show ahead of time 
because he doesn't have logic. He's, he's, he's one of the few of us on a PC. Ashley Sanderson, our audio engineer, uses Pro Tools to master the show. Okay. Um, yeah, we use logic on Macs on the re- recording side. Pro Tools is what's used on the, the final editing and mastering side, except Fan Mail Fridays, which I edit and master on the Mac with uh, Audacity. What is it? What's it called? Ophonic. So we use that. Um, then we have an artwork folder for the show notes. And then we've got a final folder for the, the actual final master. So we'll get a master back from our audio engineer. Then I'll take that master, put in all the ID3 tags, bounce it down to an MP3, and then upload that to Libsyn. And then it's, you know, someone puts it on WordPress and you guys are good to go. It goes live on Libsyn and, and then on, on the Art of Charm. Yeah, Bob Fogarty does all the WordPress work, but I go yeah. in and I put in the uh, the link to the downloadable file and the embed. We wrote, I, I actually wrote the custom WordPress plugin to do our embeds for the players, mm. which were and so all we have to do is put in the Libsyn uh, episode ID in in a in a flag inside of the the bracketed you know uh, s- short code for the WordPress yeah. plugin, and then it yeah. will just build the player for us. Yeah, so it goes live then. Most people stop there, and I know you guys do a re- really good job with social media and marketing afterwards. What what kind of things should people consider after it actually goes live that you guys do? It's all you, Jordan. Jeez, after it goes live, look, social media doesn't... I love this workflow, by the way. I, I just geek out on this, so thanks for sharing all the granular things. This is this is amazing. Once the episode goes yeah. out, goes into iTunes, I it auto it automatically goes up on our blog, which we have a WordPress to buffer plugin. Buffer's an app that shares mm-hmm. on social media, so it'll yeah. throw that in the buffer. It shares immediately, and then it'll it automatically do that. Automatically. Yep. Oh, that's awesome! It schedules it twice. That more is great for later. So it's boom, instant share, and then later on, in, it'll show up in the buffer queue two more times. And that's in Twitter, Facebook, Google+, whatever. But I don't even think about the social media. Nothing. I, I am not concerned with it at all. It's completely automated. It's automated. It a lot of, there's yeah. not a lot of engagement there. And whenever I talk There isn't. To these, really? These, yeah, there's not. And, and whenever I talk to these social media consultant guys, they're always like, oh, well, you must be doing something wrong. And then I show them our engagement, and they're like, oh, you're getting plenty of engagement. And then I realize, oh, we just have different definitions of what engagement is. Right. You get engagement on your posts. Yeah, I mean, if I get a thousand people playing the episode from a social media post, that's great. Otherwise, I don't really care. Yeah. Because, dr- look, maybe when we first started, that would have been awesome to have 200 additional plays from a social media post. For us, it's a complete drop in the bucket. doesn't move the needle anymore. It's not even close. I wouldn't even notice it. I, whenever, our di- uh, whenever our daily download numbers, and I mean daily, not per episode, not monthly, not yeah. weekly. Whenever our daily download download numbers are within five thousand of what it was the prior week, I don't even it doesn't even red send up a flag. Yeah, it's just because oh it rained in Boise, we got more downloads. Like doesn't little things like that affect stuff. You know, you see something and you're like, whoa, this release didn't do that well. Oh, it's Monday, it's Flag Day. Then Tuesday it goes through the roof. Stuff like that you'll notice where it's a national holiday. But there are times where it's raining in California, and yeah, we got a thousand fewer downloads, and oh well, it doesn't even matter. It's not a thing. So looking at social media engagement yeah. is just completely negligible. What does work? What what tends to spike downloads the the most? Grinding, grinding. Tell me about grinding. What do you mean? Yeah. I mean, we compare month to month to month. Yeah. And if we're growing month on month, great. But I mean, it's just getting great shows that people are sharing with yeah. each other. I mean, do you have a system where you're going to automatically email out the the person so that they share it or anything? It's, like it's that? not automatic. I have to manually do you that do every that. week. Okay. Yeah, because I put in uh, what we found was we've refined this over the past like year. Yeah. But so I send everybody who's coming on the show um, – Generally, you know, a couple days before because we're, you know, we're right on the cusp of when some of these things go out. So it's like I send them a link to the blog post before it comes out and said and just tell them like, you know, this will be live at this time. Mm-hmm. So don't share before that. Yeah. Here's the here's the blog post. 
here's the file URL if you want to pre-check the show. And if there's any problems with it, let me know right away and I will, I will go back and re-edit and, and, and fix anything that you're not comfortable with. Yeah. And by the way, that has never happened. Nobody yeah. has had any problems with the show so far. And then I also give them an embed URL that they can put on their blog post. Yeah. And then with a bunch of instructions on how to share, what links that they you know should be passing out to their people and how to subscribe and all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. So all of that stuff goes to the you know, the show guest before the show comes out. And we've had great success with that because everybody shares it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially because you guys are so big. So they want everyone to know that they're on the art of charm. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some of that and some of it's pre-negotiated where we're like, Hey, all right, this is really good, but we need it to be a win-win. And, and this is something that I've found more recently if we, f- if we, force isn't the right word, but if we sort of mandate slash pre agree that they're going to share this with their audience, yeah. strong, strong arm, I think is the, the proper strong, term. They try a lot harder because if I'm coming on your show and I'm like, by the way, I'm never going to share this with anybody, <laughs> the tribe is going to hear it. Who cares how I perform? Right. right. I mean, I don't really think that way, by the way, but a yeah. lot of people do. But if I'm like, oh crap, I've got to mail this out to my list. Yeah. Huh, maybe I should actually follow the prep and come up with something yeah. interesting that they'll actually care about. And yeah. it works. You put the work um, behind it. Yeah. It does. And there's a lot of people who are like, I will never do that. And I'm like, cool, you can't come on the show. And I have that luxury now. We have that they, luxury. They actually say that. I would not there's, share it. There's a couple of people that say really? that's how we do business. Wow. And I say, cool, um, ask your friends which podcast you should go on, and we'll see you in a week when everybody that you know recommends to come on Art of Charm. Because. Mm-hmm. We're at the level right now, and again, it sounds cocky, arrogant, whatever, but I'm being very real with you. Yeah. If you want to launch a book and sell it, you've got a, a handful of properties on the internet that are going to move that for you, and we are one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if you don't want to share it with your audience or you want to do that thing where you throw a link to our show in with 87 other people, when you launch your next book, you're dead to me. I can't. I just have a hard time imagining why they would not want to promote it. Like, what are the reasons? You know what? It's a scarcity mindset. Uh, some people are asked to promote too much stuff, and I get that. But you know, you should make exceptions, and they should be intelligent. But if they show come up and show up on your show, it's them talking, right? I mean, they'd be promoting their own show with you. But if they're going on twenty-seven other podcasts, I see. yeah, they want to have to share with everybody. And I just say, so make us a special deal. Yeah. And if you don't want to do that. I don't really get it because I don't treat somebody who has $5 for my company the same person who wants to invest 500000 I yeah. don't treat those people the same. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. So we look at it as a mutual thing. There's also these old school people who think, I'm doing you a favor by coming on your show because I have great <laughs> content. Those people haven't got the memo that nobody gives a crap <laughs> and that they're very replaceable. Yeah. So there's only a few people who are so unique that you have to put up with that, yeah. and those people are called celebrities. Yeah. And, you deal with it then and you find another way to make it work for you and that's totally fair because it's still win-win, right? But if somebody comes on and they're like, well, my gift to you is I'm going to come on and discuss my new book, I guess they just don't get how internet works or something. They don't get how mutual value works. If I'm going to sell 5,000 of your books, you can send me to 5,000 of your fans. I mean, or 50,000, right? I mean, it's, it's only fair. And then there's a certain contingent of people... And I don't think they're being arrogant or cocky when they do this, by the way. I think it's just like they're just not thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And there's a certain contingent of people that, that, and this is smaller, but they don't want to share because they're afraid that if people find your stuff, they're not coming back. Mm. And a lot of those people are right. <laughs> and they'll become fans of whatever show they're on. And, yeah. and the reason that we are not afraid of that is because we have worked so hard that we know we have the best out there. Yeah. So we put our shit toe to toe, pardon my Latin, with yeah. anybody in the bit, anybody, literally anybody. If I have Tony Robbins on my show, I'm not like, oh, I'm going to lose all my fans to Tony Robbins. They already know about him. There's a reason they listen to Art of <laughs> yeah. um, right. and, and frankly, you know, I look, I'm going to have other great authors and great thought leaders on the show, but there are people that come out and they, they think they got a one hit wonder and they don't want to send people in different yeah. directions. And, yeah. and just don't we we say no we're in a very unique position where we can say look if you're going to do that we don't have a show and you know what i can they always come back whether or not they come back in a week or a month or next year when they want their next book they always come back and the reason is because they ask all of their 
friends in their niche and their author friends, who, whose show do I go on? And it always comes back to AOC because mm -hmm. we make money for authors. We make money for thought leaders. We sell them. We sell their products and we sell the books. We've made people hundreds of thousands of dollars on products and books. It's amazing. It's thousands. Yeah. We don't a cut. We don't do affiliate commissions. None of that stuff. You just have to share it with your audience. So fine. Go ahead and do 50 podcasts that nobody listens to. Have fun. Or you can do one episode of AOC and just mail it out or share it. You know. But if you're not willing to do that, I'm more than happy to let you waste your time doing other people's stuff. I'm not saying every show is a waste of your time, but you could do 100 iTunes shows, actually more, and you wouldn't even equal the reach of one episode of AOC. You yeah. Could do yeah, it's true. Of average size shows, and you yeah. wouldn't equal the reach. So it do, it's just a no-brainer, but if you're not willing to make that calculation, it's not going to work, which is one reason why we almost always get guests through warm introductions. Yeah. Very rarely does somebody reach out, pitch, and come on the show. Because if you don't know one person that knows us or one person that's been on the show... What circles are you traveling in? How far in advance are you guys booked now? Like Maybe if so. someone wanted to get on. Uh, we're booked till July. July. Yeah, it's amazing. What ratio of those people that you do the uh, interview with won't air because they're just not good enough? 5%. 5%. Okay. Yeah, I think I it's think about it's 5%. Not, it's not huge. It, by the way, it's April 12th right now, so if you're saying July because people are like, oh, it's June right. or what? they're listening to this. No, this is... April, right, May, four June, months. So we're booked. Yeah. yeah, May, May, and June are completely booked. So we start recording again in July. So yeah. well, we start new, we start taking new interviews for July. Yeah. What have we missed with the flow, guys? This has been pretty thorough. I think we pretty much covered about everything. I mean, the only thing we didn't cover is like gear, but who cares about gear? What's I mean, I'm, 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 talk, I'm talking. Yeah. To, I'm talking to you right now on a you know seventy dollar yeah. microphone. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like what do you use? You can. Uh, well, in my studio, I've got three uh, EV RE27 NDs, yeah. but I'm talking to you right now on an AT2005, which okay. honestly Sounds is great. just as good Sounds as fantastic. The RE27s. Yeah. So I'm, I am going through an Apollo Twin, which also has a bunch of plugins in it. So that's a $1,000 you know, interface. So I get a $70 microphone into a $1,000 interface with you know, a couple hundred dollars worth of plugins, but it's still a $70 microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Jordan, what do you got? I've got a bunch of custom stuff that I've had made, but also I have uh, an Electro Voice RE20, goes through high quality cables, got a Rode boom arm, goes into an Apollo 8 with a bunch of custom plugins that I've tweaked and worked with that have that give me a signature sound that, that uh, well, it's my sound. Right. And it goes into, essentially it goes into the interface, which goes into Skype uh, via Thunderbolt. And it also records to a Zoom as a hard backup just in case everything explodes. I don't want the show to go away. Especially I love your duplication. I love it. Yeah, yeah. we both we, yeah, we both have Zoom uh, H6s that we and, both rec we do yeah. like output to, to static files on both of us. Wow. And then we're recording. I'm recording in Logic and then Jason's recording on his end and then the guests as well. So that way we can mix into the, the highest quality audio tracks. But also, I mean, you just never know if something crashes I don't want it to be like, oh, hey, did you get the last half of that interview with uh, right. whatever A-list person that we've worked three months, eight months to get in the show? Right. Oh, no, mine, got, mine took a nosedive. We have to have at least two redundant copies of the mix. Yeah. Um, yeah, because we, ha we, we, we have lost a, a couple shows just because of that. Because Logic will stop recording in the background, and sometimes you just don't notice it. And yep. you have to have wow. those, hard, those hardware backups because... The Zoom is one of the best backups you can get. So I've got that coming out of my interface. At the studio, I've got a PreSonus 192, and that I've got a, an output mix to uh, multiple channels that go into the Zoom, so I can at least still split channels on that. Yeah. And um, it's, it, it's well worth it. I mean, it, Zooms are not cheap. The H6s are not cheap, but I tell you what, you lose a show after you spent six, seven months getting a guest on, you're gonna kick. You're gonna kick yourself in the butt for not having that backup. Yeah. This is how professionals do it, guys. I, I appreciate you sharing this. Any other software that people should should be using? I know you talked about some of the social media software, some of the recording software. Anything else that's essential to the the process? Well, on the Mac, I use Sound Studio for a lot of it. It's mm -hmm. just a great little cheap thirty dollar waveform editor. Works amazing. Does a lot of stuff. You can't record multi-track in it, but you can edit multi-track. It's it's got like unlimited tracks for editing, so I can do my mix minus in in that and just knock it down. 
But um, for the most part, I think we both just standardize on logic. And, and, uh, Libsyn and also for uploading and yeah, use, but yeah. Ophonic. Ophonic is hands down. It's it's not cheap. It's like a hundred bucks. But Ophonic leveler. And if you're doing, hmm. if you have multi, like a multi microphone studio, Ophonic multi track also well worth the money because it will eliminate crosstalk. It will it will take all hmm. of your wave files and and cross reference them and then get the crosstalk off of the multi tracks, so huh. it's easier to edit. Huh. Anything you're still fine tuning? What are you trying to fine tune the most right now? Because I mean, you have so many. It seems like just well oiled systems in place. Anything you're tweaking lately? Like we need to make this a little bit better. On my end, I'm constantly getting the craft of hosting down to a friggin' science. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, how do you hone that craft? We need to be good at, well, do man, I take broadcast. We have consultants that have 40 years in radio that yeah. we are working with that go through and critique everything. I love that. They, listen yeah. to shows, they do a ton of that stuff. And then also, you know, the fact is we've got people here that we can learn from that are either, you know, improv classes all the way to voiceover and broadcasting classes things like that, um, and it, it's really important to constantly be learning yeah. from the best people in yeah. this. And um, You're going to edit this show, right? No. Not at all? No. All right. What the hell's uh, wrong with you? I know. You're edit, making me edit, feel edit, bad. Edit, listening, edit, to this, edit. listening to your whole process, I like, like just curled into a ball and said no, but... Um, <laughs> Look, you have to edit for content sometimes just because there's like pregnant pauses, the ums and the ahs. You got to tighten that stuff up, man. Come on. You guys there. are professionals. There's no, been no pauses except for right now. There's a pause right Play now. Play Magnum KPI. Um, not, Magnum's not going to rescue you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Magnum, Higgins might come why, to you why rescue, you ask, but not Magnum. Why did you ask about editing? Uh, just because, you know, yeah. we've been pretty candid and frankly, people yeah. who are listening to a lot of this are going to probably go, wow, these guys are giant D-bags. And the reason is because we want to give you the best content, but yeah. we didn't realize you're going to air the whole thing whole cloth. Like, look, I'm not yeah. ashamed of anything that I've said, but yeah. I think they definitely could have dialed it back a bit. I don't know. <laughs> that's I like the personality. I mean, that's that's how it is, in my opinion. You know, yeah, we just own it. We just own it. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, screw it. Jason's going to yell at me after and be like, dude, calm the hell down. <laughs> Um, hey, yeah. hey, and, and you know what? If I'm telling you to calm down, I mean, my show, you, you, you've listened to my show. You know I don't calm down. So The grumpy just, old I, geeks? I'm yeah. very passionate yeah. about this because I think a lot of people mail it in, and it's just it's disappointing. You know, I think people do really well, and I love the fact that there are so many beginners because, look, you can record something, not edit it, upload it, and you're fine. It's just it, there's a process to doing this. I don't think newbies – should do most of what we're doing. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It's not necessary. But if you want it to be professional level right. and you want to turn it into a business... It's what to aspire to. You, need you to know? Do. Yeah. What's been a huge breakthrough that you had from one of the consultants who you know, critiqued the shows? These are guys with like 40 plus years in the radio biz yeah. and we pay them to, to spank us and yeah. talk to like the the dumb little newbies relative to them that we are. Right, <laughs> That's right. true. That's true. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> You know, some of what they've told us are are things that are really obvious that we have not paid attention to. And and one of those things was, look, you're taking too long to do certain things in the show, like getting to the guest. Or, look, the clips you're using in the beginning are not interesting. You need to hook me. They're, they're mm -hmm. treating it like radio. And granted, it's a different medium. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be taken with a grain of salt. On the other hand... There's also things from radio that I think a lot of podcasters ignore that could be used, like resetting the topic because not everybody's paying attention all the time when they're right. driving listening. Or maybe people are starting the show halfway through. Or maybe somebody got in the car and now that person's totally lost, so they're going to get bored. Maybe people don't want to finish, so you reset before the commercial break. Like All of these little things that we never thought of because, oh, it's not radio – yeah, it's going to be so good, you know, yeah, like mid roll teasing a storytelling as, you know, basically an art form. You know, you want to hook them and make them want to keep listening to the entire show. So a lot of different little tricks like that. Definitely. You know, like 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 Jordan said, you know, we reset before an ad and we say what we're going to talk about when we come back from the ad. So they want to stick through the ad and keep going with the show. 
little things like that are very important that we don't think about as podcasters because most people that are in podcasting are like, oh, I got a microphone. I can talk. And yeah. no, that's not really it. It's about storytelling. It's about being engaging. And it's about giving value to the person who's listening. You don't want to waste their time. But you also want to make sure that when they're done listening to the show, that they have something that they can implement and, and take away from the show. Yeah. Not, and, and, you know, yeah, we're not, just an, we're not an entertainment podcast. We are a, a, a learning podcast and a teaching podcast. Yeah. So we have to focus on what we're going to teach these people all the way along. So what should we leave people with from each of you? Just because you bought a microphone doesn't mean you have a right to everyone's attention span. I'm just kidding. Don't leave us with that. Or we won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It is true. Look, the, the real deal is, and the motto of the Art of Charm is leave everything and everyone better than you found them. And if you guide your show like that, look, a lot of people are like, well, you didn't. You're, you're yelling at us right now. You're not leaving the truth doesn't always have to be something that makes you feel good. Right. And that's kind of a theme that runs throughout the show. And if you're helping other people get what they want, which is not a concept that we invented, obviously, you will eventually succeed. And, and what we're finding here is if you're starting a show because you want to be famous and make a business out of it or even just make a business out of it and make money, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. If, you, if you are willing to do your show, even if no one is listening, because guess what? That's the majority That's of how what happens. Start. Yeah. If you are willing to do it anyway, then you're in the right place. But yeah. don't expect to make any profit off of it for the first several years. Yeah. If you want six months to a profitable podcast, cool, but you're going to kill your audience and then I'll be there to collect them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and don't waste your money on how to podcast classes. You can learn how to do this by a couple Google searches and practice. Yeah. You know, I I started I started in podcasting about three years ago with my show Grumpy Old Geeks, and that got me to the point where practice, 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 and it got me the job working with Jordan and being the producer for The Art of Charm. Yeah, you know, and if if you if you're in this for the love of it, and you love podcasting, you love talking to people, you love getting your message out there. You and honestly, you gotta love research. Yeah, I don't know it's any huge, podcaster huge. worth their salt yeah. who does not love research because that is the core foundation of doing a great show. You have to love, you have to love research, yeah. and if you do that, and then you can come up with the best shows. It's a passion for you, you know. Yeah, and that will get you past that twelve episode hump, which is the you know that's the drop cliff for it's everybody. That small, really? Twelve episodes. Oh Most gosh. podcasts stop at twelve episodes. Uh, uh, some people wow. say six, but I, I I did my research on it, and 12 is the cutoff point for most wow. people where they just – and I hate, I hate, hate, hate this term, but they call it pod fading, mm. where they just let the podcast go. But for, you know, for the guys who stick with it, I mean we started Grumpy Old Geeks, and we said if we don't make money by episode 10, we're, we're going to never do it again. And we just finished episode 155, and we still don't make any money, but we love doing it. So that's the real key. you got to love – podcasting yeah. for podcasting's yeah. sake. Yeah. I just got really lucky because Jordan took me on as his producer and we've been just knocking it out of the park and we have a great time doing it. It's it's you know, I wake up in the morning and I get to talk to New York Times bestselling awesome. authors. I get to talk to scientists. I get to talk to, you know, people I would never ever in a million years would take my phone call, but it's my job and it's so much fun. So, you yeah. know, if you stick with it, make it a profession, uh, you can actually like really you know, have a really good time doing it. Yeah. Jason, you know, you brought in a lot of systems. What's the biggest lesson you've learned from working with the Art of Charm? Uh, the biggest lesson? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know what working the biggest lesson is. Working alongside Jordan. What, what Jordan taught you? Uh, what the hell did you teach me, Jordan? Uh, nothing. Probably. We don't <laughs> want to make his head too big, but, no, if anything, but I'm really curious. An example where it's yeah. like, okay, note to self, do not do that stuff that Jordan's doing right now. Like, you know, even earlier, this is part of Jason's job. I'm going to, I'm going to throw this behind the scenes. Look, Jason, Excellent. I was ra like ranting earlier and, and Jason goes, dial it back a bit. You sound a little bit arrogant. And I'm like, oh crap. Cause I hate that. I'm not trying to sound arrogant. I'm just very passionate about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I want people to know like, this is the way it is. And I'm just sound like a grumpy old man. He's like, you're not doing yourself any favors. So, so he'll say something like that. So really, if anything, I've just set an example for him, like what not to do. But Jason, look, you came over once and you left and you said, I've never seen anybody work that hard. I got mm. not to pat myself on the back, but you did say that when you left. And so I, yeah, you got a feel for the work ethic that's involved in this. Not that you don't have the same thing. 
Yeah, yeah, no. I think I think that's why we really kind of jive is because we both have this insane work ethic. We're like, I'm up, I'm I'm up and answering emails at five in the morning every day. You uh, know, I'm talking to people at five in the morning every day. Jordan, I, I'll I'll hit him on Slack and he'll be up too doing his thing. You know, we work really, really hard on this show. That's the other thing. It's like if you're not willing to put in the hours, every every hour of audio probably takes about ten hours at least minimum of prep. Yeah. If you're going to do it right, 10 hours yeah. of prep, you got to read the books, you got to research the guests, At least, you got to yeah. write your questions, then you go to editing and post production. You know, it, it might even come up to 15 or 20. But that's the that's the amount of dedication that you yeah. have to have when you're going to do a top level podcast. You cannot you can't you can't wing it. You just like, "Oh, hey, I got this guy coming on my show. I googled him and I got like three links." Okay. And let's chat and figure out and think that you're going to be able to carry a conversation. Right. Jordan, it does more training on how to do interviews, speaking, professional interviewing, all that stuff. Then, you know, I, I mean, I wish I could do it, but he does it every day. I look at my calendar. He's like, oh, I'm doing VO training. I'm learning Chinese and I'm going to do a podcast. You know, <laughs> it's like, trust me. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, that, that guy's got an insane work ethic. But, you know, everybody that's part of our team, that's why we picked our team that way because we all have that same kind of work ethic and you have to have that if you want to make a top level show yeah. that's i mean look at the colbert report you know or you know the late show with stephen colbert those guys are there for 14 hours a day you have to do that to do a quality show yeah we haven't talked about aj he's running all the coaching division stuff and he does all of the ceo mm-hmm. stuff for the art of charm so he occasionally makes appearances on the show and he's going to do more but the buck always stops with him. So he started off as co-host, but look, l- the business got in the way. He runs it well. Yeah. It's just that we're, ha- I'm lucky. Like I would not want a lot of what he has to deal with, frankly. Really? I, I, to be this, yeah, I kind of feel like he's like the manager. And I, I, I'm like the talent gets to do all this fun, cool stuff. And he's like, uh, I got to do taxes. And I'm like, cool. See you later. <laughs> like, oh, does he you-. like it though? He does. Okay. But I don't think he, I mean, I don't think anybody can like anything as much as I love talking yeah. and interviewing, but yeah. that's just a bias. No, I think he does like it. And, you know, it's funny because me and Jason are like, oh, it sucks to do taxes. Uh, let us know if we can help. And then we're the, we're all, <laughs> guess we'll be over here talking with this author and then we're going to go hang out with <laughs> we're, Ferris. You know, we're going like, to, we're going, we're going to hacker conventions. Cause we really do don't, stuff. yeah, we, I, you don't hear much. Uh, from AJ, he's behind the scenes managing the business. Yeah, but he's still around, and people yeah. miss him, and we get him back wherever we can. He did a yeah. couple fan mail Fridays. We're gonna have him come and sort of uh, Ed McMahon some shows as well yeah. in the future. But it's it's a it's a matter of priorities, and he's always got to service the clients first. Yeah. So he's teaching, and then he's got to make sure the wheels don't fall off of the company with the admin stuff, and then that. Yeah. So then, if he gets a few hours, and we happen to be recording a show, he'll shoot over to the LA studio and do yeah. it. Yeah, like look, I I love the fact that so many people are getting into this. Um, I think the bar is really low, and that's great. There's the pie is growing, but really the market share and the money is is only for the people at the top. And I know it yeah. sounds unfair, but it's actually rightfully so yeah. because you can get here. It just takes a long time. Yeah, it's not easy. Don't yeah. don't don't think that you're going to start a podcast and you're going to make a bunch of money right out of the gate. Yeah. It takes years and years of dedicated work and also just knowing how to grow your audience, which is a black art within itself. Yeah. Why would I want to edit any of your rants and passion? You know, that, that's my I'm, opinion. Some of it is probably less helpful cuz I, you know, at some point my eyes what is it you what is it when you like your eyes turn or you glaze over and you can't see straight and you're just talking? I don't know. I try not to get there, but it's been a long day. This is interview number eight for me. Number, oh, yeah. Well, you guys do your thing. I really appreciate you guys going into the detail and behind the scenes and being real with everyone. And, you know, just thank you so much uh, for what you guys do. I love your the show and I listen to it on a weekly basis. So thanks for that, too. You know, it comes out twice a week. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, actually, it but... comes out three times a week, but uh, <laughs> so counting? give me a hard time about it. Yeah, plus the fan mail Friday. Yeah, so it's like, oh, I listen weekly once, not to all of the episodes. Bye, guys. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. All right. You're super <laughs> fan, eh? Play <laughs> <Not> Magnum <laughs> PI. <laughs> yep, exactly. You're like, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> there we go. You can all just right. finish that. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach
Just you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 